He is risen. He is risen. Amen. You know, there, there are people all over the world who don't know that story. Each Sunday we, we come and we share a, a people group in our world who are unreached. Maybe never heard of Jesus Christ himself. You know, we, we read the Easter story and we read about the two Marys going to the tomb and seeing the angel there. And, and he says to, to them, come and see. Come and see. Be invited in. And as we pray for people groups that don't know Jesus, the unreached people groups, that's, that's the message. We want you to come and see. Today we're going to talk about the Runga people of uh, Central African Republic. They are a farming people in Central Africa. Um, they have a division of male and female labor. They live in small rural towns and some live in some cities. Currently there is zero percent Christian influence among that people group. Many of those in that people group practice Islam, believing that plants and inanimate objects have souls. As we pray, let us, let us pray that, that God will infiltrate their hearts. That there would be people who are bold enough to come to say, come and see. Come and see my Savior. Let's, let's take a few minutes of, of quiet meditation, and then I'll lead us in prayer. As we begin our Easter Sunday praying for the lost who have never heard about the risen Savior. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you. No better way to start our worship than to, than to enter, enter into your presence to, and to say, God, we love you. And we love you so much, we want to tell people about you, about your son, the risen Savior. And Lord, we pray for uh, the, the Runga people, Lord, who have never heard about you, never heard about the risen Savior. I, I pray, God, that you would, you would send missionaries, then evangelists who can relate to their culture, and can even maybe be agricultural missionaries to help them and, and Lord, to be able to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. I, I pray, we pray, for Christian radio broadcasts to be able to come in, that, that, that they would get the uh, use of the Internet so that they can hear and see and experience who you are. We thank you for this day, Lord, for the opportunity we have to praise you. And our prayer is that the Runga people, as well as us, all people of the world, will lift up our voices and praise your holy name. And it is in that name of Jesus that all the church says, Amen. Would you stand and let's praise the Lord. And if you sway, it's okay. We won't talk about you. Here we go. Let everything that, everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And this is when we're going to do it. Praise you in the morning. Praise you in the evening. Praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you in laughing. Praise you when I'm grieving. Praise you every season of the soul. If we could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease to praise him. Right? Amen? Let's do it. Let everything, let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise you in the heavens, join with the angels. Praise you on the earth now, join our creation, calling all nations to your name. If they could see how much you're worth, 
your power, your might, your endless love, then surely they would never cease to praise. That everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise. Okay, come on. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And you say, Amen. You may be seated. Thanks so much for being here. As we uh, worship together on this Easter Sunday, I look out and I see such beautiful faces, and I even see Pastor Daniel. And uh, no, I, I love you, I love you, Pastor. I, but we are so delighted that you've chosen to worship with us, and especially if this is your your first time with us, we would ask that you would uh, uh, take a, a guest card. You'll find that in the pew rack in front of you, and fill that out. And at the conclusion of our service. We'd like to ask you if you just give that to one of our greeters or one of the pastors in the back. And, and uh, we would appreciate the, the opportunity just to correspond with you this week and say thanks for being here and worshiping with us. We know you could choose other places to go, but you chose to be here. I'm not going to read the bulletin to you, <clears throat> so uh, there are lots of things going on. So please, uh, please read the bulletin of things that are, that are happening. But I do want to call attention, you know, Pastor Daniel finished a series on the gospel uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, uh, it, those of us that come on Wednesday nights, he quizzed us every Wednesday night about the, the letters of the gospel. In your, in your worship folder, in your, in your uh, bulletin, there was a card that, it, that looks exactly like this. And it is the gospel. And it's an opportunity for you just to take this and, you know, to, one, remind yourself of what the gospel truly is. And also an opportunity for you to use it as a witnessing tool. So we wanted to provide that as we share together. Uh, in worship and in witness and remember what what is our vision I'm going to quiz on Pastor Daniel what is our vision we exist for who others so telling them about the gospel isn't that the, isn't that the greatest thing we could do for others oh I don't know what happened Ethan should I do it again yeah t t telling people about the gospel and the good news isn't that the greatest thing we could do for people Amen. And we're going to pray for people. We have some folks in our church and in our community who uh, have some special needs. I'm going to invite Brother Danny to come as, uh, as uh, he leads us as we pray together. I have a couple of special prayer requests for the family of Donnie Connor and also for Annette and Jed Mabry. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Easter Sunday. We thank you for all the blessings that, that you give us every day, Father. But most of all, we thank you for the most precious gift that we could ever receive, and that's sending your son to die for us, to be buried and rise again so we could have salvation. We ask that you uh, be with everything that's done here in this service today, Lord. We ask you to, to be with Daniel as he brings the message. Uh, be with other one in our community and our church that, that may be suffering and, and have sickness right now. And most of all, Father, I ask that if, if there's anyone uh, in this service today that does not know you, that they would come to a uh, decision to, to be born again. We ask these things in your name. Amen.
So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Pastor Daniel has been preaching a series about the road to redemption. Would you stand as we continue to worship, singing about the one who gives us redemption, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross He suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer. With His blood He purchased me. On the cross He sealed my Tell the wondrous story how my lost estate to save in the boundless love and mercy he the ransom free he gave. Sing or oh, sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my part. Amen. You may be seated. Watch this. It was designed to punish. It was created to kill. It was meant to showcase earthly power on the side of a hill. It was wood and rope. It was hammer and nails. It was degradation, then death. And it never failed. It was chosen to stop the Christ, to erase the message he taught. It was the bitter end of Jesus. At least, that's what they thought. It was intended to defeat to put down, to make the disciples give up, but instead it became the symbol of God's love. The icon of death became the icon of true living. What once marked the end is now the mark of the beginning, a mark of forgiveness, of new life, of new birth. What began at Calvary now covers the earth over cities, over hospitals, through the streets, through homes. The picture of God's sacrifice is our picture of hope, the lasting image of our Savior and salvation's great cost. This is more than a symbol. This is the cross. As we look, we see the cross. We see the cross in the back. On some of the pews, at the end of the pews, there's a cross. It's just a reminder. 
not certainly at the death of Christ, but more so the sacrifice. May we never forget what Jesus did. Would you stand as we plead to God through song to lead us to that cross? So, amen. You may be seated. Yeah, thank you so much for being here today. It, it's so great to see a full house with uh, brothers and sisters united together, prepared to hear from the Lord. You know, today, with it being such a special Sunday, Easter Sunday, we uh, with it being the fifth Sunday and an Easter Sunday, it's kind of the perfect storm. Uh, because typically fifth Sundays, we don't have children's worship. And then you add on Easter Sunday, on top of that, that's a Sunday that we want families to be together. So, you know, e even amongst our singing, you know, you can hear the, the, the children making noise. And look, I, I just want to say this, like parents, like don't feel bad if, if your kids are making noise. Look, I got one, I know, Okay. <laughs> He's five, okay, but like they're all capable of that, and it's okay, you know. They 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 are making noise, which is cheerful to the Lord. So look, don't don't feel bad if you if you have to go, as you see in the bulletin, we've got our nursery available if you need it, but don't feel obligated. All right, we 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 love hearing those children, and uh, 
and we're thankful that you're here today. Uh, before we get into our message today, let, let's just go to the Lord, just asking Him to speak to us, be, because it's, it's God who changes. It, it, it's not a man, it, it's not me, it, it's not anyone else here. It, it's His Spirit at work in us that brings about change. Uh, so let's ask Him to move within our hearts and minds to remove any distractions that might be getting in the way of us hearing what God wants to speak to us uh, today. So let's go to the Lord. God, we, we thank You for today. Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate the fact that you are not a dead Savior, you are a risen Savior. And God, that, that through you taking up your life, a life that you gave of your own free will, God, you show us that not only do we have victory in you and because of you, but we can have victory in our lives because we are filled by the same Spirit. We are filled by you. We don't have to live lives that are defeated by sin. We can live lives of victory just as you triumphed over the grave. And so, God, I, I pray that in these moments as we look into your word and specifically an exchange between you and Peter, that, God, we would see ourselves in this story and that through your spirit at work in this building, in this room right now, uh, that you would show us ways in which we are falling short, ways in which you want to redeem us to something greater than what we're currently experiencing so that we can leave here today changed. And God, will praise you in advance for what you're going to do. And we pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're wrapping up this three-week journey, this road to redemption. You know, we've heard throughout this series that redemption, it is an act of compensating or making amends for a fault or a mistake. Redemption isn't necessary for perfect people. Redemption is only necessary if you mess up. And I think for all of us here, we can agree, we all fall into that category. We're not perfect. If you think you're perfect, you're prideful. And that's a sin. So you're not perfect. We all fall short. We all come up significantly and infinitely short of God's perfect standard. So we're all in need of redemption. Two weeks ago, we began this series by looking at one of the worst moments in anyone's life, but specifically the life of Peter, where Peter, a man who was very bold in his following of Jesus, very vocal about how he would never fall away when confronted by a servant girl and a few others, he denied even knowing Jesus going as far as calling down curses on himself, basically saying, may God strike me dead if I'm lying about knowing this man. And it was one of his worst moments. And we're told that immediately after he did that, after he denied Christ the third time, he heard a rooster crow. And this triggered something in Peter because Jesus had previously told him that same night before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And when he heard that rooster crow, it says that he went out and he wept bitterly. What Peter showed in that moment was genuine remorse for what he knew he just did. But I think also by weeping bitterly, Peter is showing deep sorrow at the thought that what he did was unredeemable. Jesus is about to die. There's going to be no chance to make things right. He's stuck in his denial. And, and I think as we think about that moment in the life of Peter, some of us here, we can relate to that. Because like Peter, we have had moments in our life where we know we have hurt others. Others who are very close to us. Peter and Jesus were close. They were tight. There was a bond there. And, and Peter knew in that moment, I let the person who loves me most down. And no doubt there have been moments in our lives when we've done the same. We've let people down, whether through our words or through our actions or maybe just even in our thoughts, which we keep hidden away, but we know we've let them down. Maybe you've done things in your mind that are an offense to God, and it's so evil in your mind that it's unforgivable. 
What you've done has basically disqualified you from ever being used by God. And you can't even bring yourself to approach God anymore because you're so filled with shame and guilt and regret. But I love what Billy Graham says. He says, at the cross... Jesus purchased our redemption and provided a righteousness which we could not ourselves earn. Now, you're right in feeling that guilt and shame for your sin, but don't let it keep you from the Savior because you're never going to be good enough to go to Him. You go to Him in your brokenness, and He is the one who redeems you. We don't get to redeem ourselves. Jesus is the Redeemer. We are the fallen, but he picks us back up when we fall. You see, through the work of Jesus on the cross, what we see is that redemption is available to all who come to him. There are no conditions. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. That does not have to define your present or your future. Redemption is available if you would go to Jesus. And that's what we're going to see in this passage today. That despite Peter's denial, despite what led him to weep bitterly, and man, for some guys, you know, wives here, I mean, Julie can attest to this, like, some of you guys, I, I fall into this category, like, we don't cry. Now, it, you know, for me, it's not like it's a sign of weakness, and I don't want to show weakness. I, like, I just don't do it. Like, there are very few things that make me cry. And like, Julie could probably count on one hand the times she's seen me cry in our over 15 years of marriage. You know, but for Peter in this moment, when he denied Christ, he wept bitterly. You know, yet even in those things that break us, there is redemption available. And we're going to see that in our passage in John 21. But not just for Peter. Let Peter's story, let this moment in his life be an example for what is possible for us today. So in John chapter 21, we're going to focus on just three verses today. 15, 16, and 17. And this story is much larger, but, but really the, the, there's so much within these three verses. It's all we've got time to look at today. Now at this point in the scripture, just to kind of set the stage, to build the context of what's going on, Jesus has already been resurrected by John 21. He's appeared numerous times to all his disciples. He's told them, go ahead of me to Galilee and I will meet you there. Now, it's been somewhere between two to three weeks since the resurrection. All right, so this isn't like the resurrection just happened yesterday or a few days ago. It's been two to three weeks. The disciples are all in Galilee now. And John 21 opens up. The disciples are in Galilee, and Peter speaks up saying, Guys, I'm going fishing. Now, scholars are kind of torn whether Peter, by saying, I'm going fishing, You know, whether he's saying, I'm going to revert back to an old lifestyle. Other scholars say, you know, that when Jesus died, he had many donors. People were giving to his ministry, which empowered the disciples to to go with Jesus from place to place. And they're not working in a sense that they're working at a job making money. They relied on the generosity of others. Now that Jesus is dead, that income source is gone. You know, so other scholars say they're going fishing to get some money to continue, in essence, to follow the risen Christ. So they go fishing, and it says that Peter takes six other disciples with them, and and those disciples are listed early in John 21. We're told that they fish all night, and they catch nothing. Early in the morning, they're about 100 yards out from shore. And they notice this man walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And this man calls out to them, Hey, have you caught anything? And the disciples obviously discouraged that they answer back, No, we haven't caught anything. And this man calls out, Well, throw your net out again. And they do. And they catch so many fish they can't even haul it in. And in that moment... Peter realizes it's Jesus because this has happened before. You read about the calling of the disciples. This is like the exact same thing that happened earlier. 
with Jesus and the disciples, what led them to leave everything to follow Jesus. So Peter, realizing it's Jesus, jumps in the water. John says he swam about a hundred yards. Now, look, that's a long way to swim. That's a long way to run. But to swim, he swims a hundred yards and reaches shore. The disciples follow shortly after. And it says that when they got to Jesus, Jesus, he's got a charcoal fire going with fish and bread. He's got breakfast ready for the disciples. And he invites them to to eat breakfast with him. And that sets the stage for what we're going to read in verses 15 through 17. John writes, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, yes. He said to him, You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. And he asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? So Peter replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Now I think it's important that we acknowledge that Jesus confronted Peter in front of the other disciples. And I think the reason that's important is because just as Peter's denial of Jesus was public, so was Jesus' restoration of Peter public. You see, Jesus restored Peter in the presence of the other disciples, causing him to confront and own up to his recent failures. Now, we're not sure if the other disciples knew about the denials. If, If any of the disciples knew, it was most likely John, because we're told that John was the one who got Peter into the high priest's courtyard. So John was most likely there. Whether John overheard Peter's denials, we're not sure. But what Jesus chose to do in this moment was to make this a public confession. You know, a verse that you'll hear a lot in church is James 5.16, one of my favorite verses in the book of James. But what you don't hear oftentimes is the verse in its entirety. You hear the last part of the verse. Okay, but but let me read the entire verse, and you'll see why we only hear one part. In James 5, 16, James, the brother of the Lord, writes, Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. We don't hear that part. But what we like to focus on is this last statement, the prayer of the righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Now we like the second sentence. The prayer of the righteous is very powerful. That that as we pray, God works through our prayers. It's powerful. Don't give up. Keep praying. What we don't like is that part about confess your sins to one another. That seems a little too Catholic. Now look, Let me tell you, confessing your sins to others doesn't make you Catholic. It just makes you biblical, right? I mean, it's it's what we're told to do here. But it goes against the grain. Like there's something within us. We don't want to confess our sins to others. You know, we we can kind of self-righteously think in our minds, look, I don't need to confess my sins to others. I can go straight to the source. I didn't didn't sin against somebody else. I sinned against the Lord. So I'm going to confess my sins to Him and that's enough. And now, you rightly so do need to confess your sins to the Lord, but there is power in confessing sins to others. Think about the beginning in Genesis chapter 3 where it all went wrong, where it all went south. What happened? They took from from, from the tree of knowledge and good and evil... They ate it, and as soon as they ate the fruit, they realized their nakedness, and what did they do? They covered it up. They not only covered themselves up, but it says when they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, what did they do? They ran and hid themselves. See, what that tells us is that sin causes isolation. 
sin, what it does in you, the power it holds over you, is it tries to separate you from everybody else. It tries to make you hide your sin, to cover it up, to keep a mask over it so that other people don't know what's going on. And man, we're so good at that in the church. Hiding our failures, hiding our mistakes, hiding our sins, appearing before others as though we've got our act together. We, we, we have all the answers. We're always happy. Things are always going good in our lives. We're never making mistakes. But we know the depths of our depravity. But we're not opening up to others about that. And I think what Peter, this dialogue with Jesus is showing is that public confession of sin, it breaks the power of sin. Because sin wants you to isolate. But Jesus is saying, let's get it out in the open so we can deal with it. There's power in airing it out. It brings accountability. So by confronting Peter openly, Jesus is helping Peter to experience healing. That's what James says. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? So that you may be healed. You see, if we want to move past some of the sins that are weighing us down. Some of the sins that you know right now, it's weighing you down. You don't even feel like you're supposed to be here because of the sins that you have done. And you're like, man, God's going to strike me dead if I walk in that church. Because He knows what I've done, and I know what I've done. And I shouldn't be here. You see, if we want to move past those things, we need to find trustworthy believers who we can be open with. Now, the sad thing is that in the church, there are untrustworthy believers. That if you go airing your sins to them, everybody's going to know. Don't tell those people. And that's not what James is saying. James is saying, find people that you know love you. You see, Jesus confronted Peter in the midst of his peers, the other disciples. He didn't do this in front of a crowd of 500. He confronted Peter in the midst of friends who had a bond, and there was accountability there. And for us, we need to find people who we know they love us, they, we, we can trust them, who we can be open and honest with them, and they're not going to go blabbering to everybody else, but they're going to pray for us, and they're going to walk with us through those dark valleys to help us be redeemed. Now, there are a few things about this passage in John 21, verses 15 and 16, that I want us to point out. Some things are obvious and some things are much more subtle. Now the first thing is the most obvious thing. That Jesus asked Peter, how many times? Three times. Do you love me? Now clearly, this is a connection to his three denials. Peter denies Jesus three times. And Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? There's a clear connection there. Now, the first time, if you look in verse 15, the first time Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? It's worded differently. He says, do you love me more than these? Now, most likely, Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples? You see, Jesus is reminding Peter of what he said just a few weeks prior to this moment. If you remember, on the night of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus and his disciples, they're walking to the garden, and Jesus tells his disciples, guys, all of you are going to fall away because of me. In essence, you're going to desert me. You're going to abandon me. And in that moment, Matthew, in Matthew 26, verse 33, here's what we're told is Peter's reply. Peter replied, even if everyone else falls away because of you, I will never fall away. In essence, I love you more than these. I, Peter, love you more than all the other disciples, Jesus. Because even if they abandon you, I will never abandon you. And here is Jesus... His first question to Peter is, do you love me more than these? How interesting that Jesus 
would put on Peter the same thing Peter declared just a few weeks prior. It's as if Jesus wanted to know, Peter, do you still have that prideful estimation of your love for me that you claimed just a few weeks ago? Or are you a little bit more humble about it? And now notice another thing. Notice what Jesus does and does not ask Peter. Jesus didn't ask Peter, Peter, are you sorry for what you did? He didn't ask that. He could have. Jesus didn't ask Peter, Peter, do you promise to never deny me again? And that would have been a fair question, but that's not what Jesus asked. What did Jesus ask? Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He could have asked the other questions, but he didn't. Instead, he asked, do you love me? I like the way Alexander McLaren puts it. He says, Jesus asked each one of us, not for obedience primarily, not for repentance, not for vows, not for conduct, but for our heart. Why? Why would Jesus ask for that instead of those other things? I mean, doesn't Jesus want our obedience? Does he want our repentance? Does he want our good conduct? Does he want our vows? Of course. But see, what we have to realize is go back to what Jesus himself said in John 14, 15. Jesus speaking to his disciples says, If you love me, you'll obey my commands. You'll keep my commands. See, Jesus knows this. Jesus knows that if he has your heart, he's got everything else. He didn't need to ask Peter, Peter, are you sorry for what you did? Because by asking, do you love me, he's asking that same question. Are you sorry? Because if you really love me, you're going to be sorry. Jesus, I, Jesus didn't have to ask Peter, do you promise to never do that again? Because by asking, do you love me, he's asking that. Because if Peter really loves Jesus, he's not going to deny him like that again. And see, just as Jesus asked Peter that question... Jesus is asking the same question to us today. Do you love me? And now let's be clear that Jesus was not asking Peter that question. And Jesus does not ask us that question because he doesn't know the answer. Like Jesus in that moment wasn't genuinely curious. Like I'm not sure if you love me, Peter, so I'm going to ask you. And Jesus knows all things. That's what Peter said. Lord, you know all things. You know everything. Like, I don't, I'm going to answer you, but I know that you already know the answer. And when Jesus asks us that question, do you love me? It's not like Jesus doesn't know already. He knows your heart. So why does he ask? Jesus asked the question for our own self-reflection. Our own self-examination. See, Jesus knows if you love him, but do you know? I think that's what Jesus is driving home. Jesus wanted to help Peter know, do you really love me? Not for Jesus' sake, but for Peter's sake. And Jesus asked the same question of us, not for his sake, because he already knows the answer. He asked us that question so that we would know the answer. You see, I think the longer you're in church, the longer you are programmed to have a default answer to certain questions. That when you hear a question like, do you love Jesus? Your automatic default answer is, yes, I love Jesus. Because we're too scared to say otherwise. That's not the church answer. That's not the Baptist answer. But what really matters is an honest answer. If God already knows, why should we give some fake default answer of, yes, Jesus, I love you, when it's not even true? You're just deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. You're holding yourself back from redemption. In essence, you're Adam and Eve in the garden hiding behind a bush 
trying to cover up the reality of what's going on. Because you're not being honest. So it takes self-reflection, really looking in the depths of our heart to say, do I really love Jesus? Do I love Jesus more than I love wealth? Do I love Jesus more than I love being popular and acceptable in other people's eyes? Do I love Jesus more than my career? Do I love Jesus more than my family? Do I love Jesus more than my hobbies? Do I love Jesus more than being religious in church? Do I love Jesus more than going to church? Do I love Jesus more than being elevated in the eyes of others? And it's by asking ourselves those questions that that's what we have to deal with. That's what we have to come to terms with. And if your answer is no, it is better that you say, no, I don't love you that much, than to lie and deceive ourselves. Because redemption begins when we go to Him in our brokenness. When we go to Him saying, Lord, I'm having trouble loving you that much. I'm not there yet. And when we do that, when we're open and honest with Jesus, that's where redemption begins. You see, before this moment, as I read in Matthew 26, Peter had a much more elevated view of his love for Jesus. Because in in Matthew 26, where we we already read that verse where Jesus asked, or, or where Peter declares to Jesus, I love you more than these. If everyone falls away, I'll never fall away. But now Peter's a little bit more honest. He's a little bit more humble in his view of his love for Jesus. Pete, now, notice in the first question, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? But notice Peter's response. He doesn't say, I love you more than these. Now, he said that in Matthew 26, but Peter's a little more honest here. So his answer is... You know that I love you. But that's not what Jesus asked. Jesus didn't ask, do you love me? He said, do you love me more than these? Yet Peter replies, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, that's a little bit less than what he was claiming prior. And there's even more to it than that. You see, on the surface level, it would appear as though Jesus' three questions and Peter's three replies are pretty much the same. You know, three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter gives the same answer, Lord, you know that I love you. It appears that there's no difference. It's just a lot of repetition. But you got to go into the original language to see the difference. Because the English language doesn't do justice to this passage. It can kind of blind us to what's really going on. So let's unpack this briefly. In verses 15 and 16, Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? Using the word for love, agape. Now, if you've been in church a while, perhaps you've heard that word before, agape, love. Agape love is the word that we use to describe God's perfect love. God's perfect love between the Father, Son, and Spirit, and God's perfect love for humanity. Agape love is love in its highest, purest form. It is a selfless love. It is a sacrificial love. To put it in the simplest terms, you could say agape love is love at 100%. So the first two questions in verse 15 and 16... Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me at a hundred percent? Now, looking at the English language, you would see no difference in Peter's response. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter replies, Lord, you know I love you. It seems that Peter is saying, yes, Jesus, what you're asking me, yes, I do. But if you look in the original language, Peter responds to Jesus' two questions using not the word agape, but the word phileo. Now, phileo is a word for love, but it means brotherly love. 
You know, it's where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's where that word, that's the meaning of the word phileo. Brotherly love. It means friendly affection. Again, to put it in the simplest form, you could say, whereas agape love is love at 100%, phileo love is love at 70%. Okay, so Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me at 100%? And Peter two times replies, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. You know that I love you at 70%. So do you notice the difference here in the question and the response? Think about it this way. You know, parents, you know, a, a game that you often play with your children when they're little is, you know, you'll ask your kids, do you love me this much? And when you start out really small, you know, do, do, do you love me this much or do I love, does mommy love you this much? Does daddy love you this much? And you keep going and you keep going until you're like, does daddy love you this much? And it's like, yeah, because you can't go any further than that. You know, this is how much I love you, 100%, not 70%, 100%. This is how much I love you. So it's almost as if Jesus is asking Peter in this moment, not Peter, do you love me, phileo, love? He's saying, Peter, do you love me, agape, love? And as Jesus extends his hand, Peter notices those nail scars in his hands. And Peter, being a broken and humbled man, can't bring himself to say, Jesus, I love you with the same love that put you on the cross. Yes, Jesus, I love you with the same love that held you to the cross, that led you to suffer and die for me. He can't bring himself to say it. He can't say, yes, I love you, agape love. The only thing he can say is, Jesus, I love you, phileo love. But I can't say that I love you, agape love. I know that's a love only you have. A love that only you are capable of. I like the way James Boyce puts it, describing Peter's response. He says, Peter, by saying, I love you, phileo love. Peter is simply saying that he loves Jesus with the best love of which he, a sinful human being, is capable. Peter saying, Jesus... My love has limits. Your love has no limits. And you proved it by going to the cross. But Jesus, I love you with the best maximum love that I can give you. And that's 70%. I can't give you anymore. Because I know I can't give you the love that you have for me. But I do love you with all that I can. Which makes Jesus' final question even that much more powerful. And like I said, the English language doesn't reveal this to us. But when you get into the original language, the first two times Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me 100%? But the third time Jesus switches things up. The third question in verse 17, Jesus met Peter where he was by asking Peter, do you phileo love me? Do you love me 70%? And isn't that just like Jesus? to meet us where we are, to meet us in our frailty, to meet us in our brokenness, to meet us in our limitations. That he doesn't continue asking, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you agape love me? Do you agape love me? No, he stops. He says, okay, Peter, I get what you're saying. I get your honesty now. So, Peter, do you phileo love me? Really? Do you love me 70%? And now verse 17, it says that Peter was grieved that the Lord asked him the third time, do you love me? Now, it could be that Peter was simply grieved that Jesus asked three times. And that brought up the third denial. And Peter seen the connection now. And that brought grief on Peter. It could also be that Peter was grieved by the change of the word for love by Jesus. That Jesus twice asked Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me 100%? But now Jesus is putting into question even Peter's quote-unquote safe love. 
a, a love that Peter thought he was safe in claiming, a love that Peter thought in his mind he was being humbled by giving that answer. That Jesus, I can't say I love you 100%, but I can say that I love you 70%. And that's got to be acceptable. It's as if in Peter's mind, Jesus was calling into question even the lesser love that he thought he was safe claiming. But you see, even though Jesus' question brought Peter grief initially, it was necessary for Peter to experience redemption. You know, as we wrap up, you know, for the vast majority of us here, if you were to experience some physical pain, some physical illness, some physical suffering, most likely you would go to a doctor. You, 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 would, you would try to get help in order to treat what pain you're dealing with. You know, it's, it's a natural human response that as we experience pain, we want to get rid of the pain. You know, so we'll go to those who are trained to provide relief. Yet when it comes to spiritual pain... When it comes to spiritual suffering, instead of dealing with it, we try to bottle it up. We try to hide it. We try to ignore it. And there are so many people in the church that they're not only suffering with physical pain, but they're suffering with spiritual pain. They're, they're, they're suffering in their relationship with Jesus, and they refuse to go to the great physician who can heal them. And instead, they try to bottle these things up. But what we have to know is that redemption, it required Jesus to suffer and die. But redemption will also require our willingness to suffer the pain of addressing our own wounds. Peter was a wounded man after his denial. And Jesus confronted him on that. And it brought Peter grief. It humbled Peter. He wasn't the same man he was before this moment. And redemption will require the same of us. It will require that you address those wounds, that you address those failures and faults, and you bring them before Jesus. See, Jesus, he didn't die on the cross and raise from the dead so that you could stay stuck in your past failures and your past sins. Jesus came. He died and He raised from the dead to forgive you. He came to transform you. He came to empower you. He came to redeem you so that you wouldn't be stuck in those old things, but that you could experience newness of life and freedom so you could boldly live for Him. If we want to experience redemption in our lives, we have to be willing to confront the darkest parts of ourselves and simply lay them bare before Jesus. Don't allow sin to isolate you. Don't allow sin to cause you to run and hide, to keep those things hidden away from the sight of others. Instead, as James says, be open. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other and experience healing as a result. Prayer is powerful. And so when we pray with each other and when we pray to our Father, we know that we can be healed from those things that weigh us down. Redemption is available. The question is, will you allow Jesus to redeem you? Not just for your benefit, but so that other people can experience redemption because of the way God is redeeming you. You see, this moment was a moment where Jesus redeemed Peter. And from that moment on, Peter, he was different. He was changed. And Peter became that rock that Jesus declared, I will build my church on. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter went on to be a life changer, leading thousands to Christ. But it started with this moment of redemption. That was one man. That was 11 disciples Jesus used to turn the world upside down. And what could God do with a group of 200 in Henry County that experienced His redemption personally and allowed the redemption they experienced to lead them to draw others closer to the Redeemer? And God could use us as a powerful force 
in our county, in our state, in our nation, in our world, if we would let Him. But it starts with what you experience with your relationship with Him. Don't let those sins hold you back. Get them out there. Lay them before His feet and let Him pick you up. Scripture says, those who humble themselves before the Lord will be exalted. Come humbly to Him. Be open to Him about your love for Him. If you can't say, Jesus, I don't even know if I love you phileo love. I don't even know if I love you 70%. Start there. Be open. Be honest. Tell Him, Jesus, there are things in my life that I love way more than you. And I'm not going to try to hide it. I want to be open. But Jesus, I don't say those things out of pride. I say them out of brokenness because I know that's wrong. And I want to love you more. Free me from these things. And surround yourself with others who will help you to experience freedom from those things that hold you back. And that will be the first step in you being unleashed as a powerful force for God, for good, that draws people to Christ. Will you let Jesus do that in you so that others can experience redemption as well? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're a God of redemption. You're a God of second third, fourth, fifth, a hundred chances. You know, Peter let you down big time. You know, but you didn't write Peter off. You didn't say, I'm done with you. You were willing to work in the midst of his brokenness. And God, I know that you offer the same for us. That, that we, we, were, we are a broken, we are a messed up, we are a faulty people, Fort Trial Baptist Church. We, we make mistakes and the things we think, we make mistakes in the things we say, we make mistakes in the things we do. There, God, there are things that you call us to do that we don't do. And there are things that you tell us to abstain from that we do anyway. And so, God, I pray that even in this time of invitation, you would reveal through your spirit those things in our lives that hold us back from you. And that instead of wallowing in, in guilt and shame, we would just come to you boldly as sons and daughters of the King and experience freedom, experience redemption through you. That you would free us from those shackles that hold us back, from those chains that weigh us down. And we could walk out of here free. We could walk out of here redeemed. We could walk out of here changed so that other people can notice that in us and be drawn to you by the way you're working in our lives. God, I know there are people in this room right now that you want to free, that you want to walk out of here different. So God, I pray that through your spirit, you would work in their lives. And God, whether they deal with you where they're at right now, whether they feel the need to come down and pray at this altar or come and talk to myself, God, whatever they need to do, let them know. And God, help us all to be willing to deal with you in the way you call us to in these few moments as we sing. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief but sweat drops of blood for mine.
comes in glory, his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Amen. In Christ, you are redeemed. Amen. And that, that's something that's true not only for us who have experienced it, but that's true for anyone who would go to Christ. And, and as great as it is to see a room with this many people in it, there are so many that are not in a room like this. And, and they don't know that redemption is available. That they're being held captive by those sins, by those things that weigh them down. And, and the only way they're going to know about it is if we tell them. You know, so let's leave here today as we go our separate ways, whether if it's today or sometime this week, be a light of redemption to somebody. Don't let them stay in that darkness. Share with them the hope that is available in Jesus Christ. And let God use you to be a life changer for somebody else. And God used his followers to do that, and that's why we're here today. Because men like Peter decided, I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to be bold. And 2,000 years later, there's churches all over the globe because of what those 11 men did through the power of Christ in them. And what could God do with millions of followers of Christ today to spread His truth to others? Uh, so let's do that as we go. Today we're going to uh, allow our benediction to be a song we will glorify. And let this song as we sing, let it be your testimony as you leave here today. That's what I'm going to do. Today and from this day forward, I'm going to glorify the Lord with my life. Let's sing. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great. I am Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty we will bow before his throne we will worship him in righteousness we will worship him alone he is Lord of heaven Lord of earth he is Lord of all Lord above the universe, all praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Amen.